Hey everyone, welcome to the Dead Horse Podcast. I'm your host this week, Arvind. Joining me are Vivek. Hey guys. And Ashwin. Hey. And today we are going to discuss the usual stuff, gaming and gaming news and whatnot. What uh, let's start with, uh, let's start with the news actually. Uh, there was this article on Kill Screen, which was about what kind of games could potentially be made with an Oculus Rift. So yeah, let's do a thought experiment here and like start with Vivek. Uh, Vivek, if you were to design your Oculus Rift, Rift game, what would that game be like? I think first person, any kind of first person game for sure. But I think a game in which one-to-one looking around in your environment can actually affect it would be a very interesting experiment with the Oculus. You know, because the, the key thing that the Oculus brings to... Uh, gaming experiences is you can literally control the way the character looks around the world. So if you can look around the world and interact with it that way, I think a game that did that with using the Oculus would, uh, you know, break new ground in terms of the kind of experiences that you have to offer. Because if you're just going to, you know, put an Oculus Rift on and uh, shoot people, or if you're just going to put an Oculus Rift on and play Mass Effect, that's already been done. There's not, they're not breaking new ground there. Uh, I think since it's such a an interesting new device, we got to change the way we interact with games on that platform. That's my 50 paisa. Yeah. Uh, Ashwin, what do you think? I think we, we'll be able to make uh, new games which, which would have been boring without an Oculus Rift. This is kind of far-fetched. Like, imagine a game where you're sitting on a park bench, maybe, in a crowded street uh, or on the ocean front, and you're just watching the people. Maybe you're a detective. That sort of a game might not do very well on the kind of interfaces that we have now. Maybe you want to follow a suspect. But with an Oculus, I think, uh, where you just have to sit and look around, and uh, physically look around, might be interesting and not too boring. So I guess we will be exploring in different directions uh, with yeah. this new kind of yeah, input. I just actually, yeah. when I should uh, that, uh, the first thing that I thought of was a game in which you're a person in a crowd and you're looking for a suicide bomber. So you got to spot the person who is, you know, walking around with a suicide vest. <laughs> hmm. If you could, uh, like, could take it something like Papers, Please, where it's randomized every time and you've got to figure out where the bomber is and you have different levels and stuff like that. So it involves profiling and, and things like that. I don't know. That's what I thought of instantly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like uh, I actually played an Oculus Rift game at NGDC. Like one of the developers had an Oculus Rift and they had a prototype. So, And the interesting thing about it was that uh, turning around 180 degrees was very tough. Because you had all this, like you were standing in an expo area and you had these headphones and Oculus Rift on. Uh, so I'm not sure if it would be uh, like exactly suited to a completely look around the all around you game but yeah spotting the like the, the easiest sort of games would be to like to where you have to spot certain things and another thing may actually this might actually be a great idea for a horror game uh, because like and here I join the literally thousands of people who have thought of this before. <laughs> Uh, do, like, do you think it would it would have potential in like horror or even like stealth games? Because... Well, yeah. Like again, as as you were speaking, I thought uh, Spy Party should definitely try and get on the Oculus Rift. I think that would be a great game to be on the Oculus Rift, actually. Uh, also, like horror for sure, because but the the dangerous thing about putting a horror game is I think you'd have to you'd have to age gate those horror games. I don't think kids will be able to play the kind of horror games that go on an Oculus Rift. They might be there's a very narrow set of people who want to be that scared by an experience. There's There are people who, you know, do let's plays of horror games. And most of the let's play videos I've seen on YouTube of people playing Oculus Rift horror games, even the people who regularly play these, regularly play horror experiences for a living are so terrified by the games in the Oculus Rift. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's, it's a completely different experience from what they're normally used to. And I think it's because of the kind of sensory overload. When you're looking at something on a screen, there's still a sense of detachment. When 
this is what your eyes are seeing and you can't see anything else around you the sense of yeah. fear becomes a lot more heightened so yeah. if i can ask uh, uh, arvin the question so when you tried it on did the lower resolution uh, put you off uh yeah this was actually a thing which i was about to say uh like if i brushed against the wall and like got too close to a wall the texture mm-hmm. would just get stretched on the screen and i would get a headache and this yeah. happened to quite a lot of people uh i remember like a couple of people like the the, the developer with the Oc- oculus rift their booth was right next to mine so a cup cu- a couple of people just put put on the oculus rift then like 10 seconds later nope sorry i'm getting motion sickness then a few of them were were uh, like a couple of minutes in and so there are definitely a significant group of people who cannot actually handle the the whole oculus rift thing so yeah it would actually like i think it would narrow the audience as well because obviously like a person needs to buy the rift and then like be be not susceptible to motion sickness and stuff yeah like there is one person in the world who can solve texture issues it's their cto right <laughs> <laughs> yeah mega textures for the win uh, if anyone can solve it it is john carmack and i think yeah, he was no, uh, the problem actually is not the textures themselves it's the low resolution of the the uh, ips because like yes. our eyes probably see in a much larger resolution than even 1080p hmm. and like the initial dev kit the one i had that had a something like 614 to 480 resolution for each eye so that okay. isn't really much if you like look at it it's so if that close to your eye i think you you probably need a very high fidelity display to eliminate the sense of disconnect and motion sickness and stuff do you think then that more stylized games would benefit more like say playing super hot on an oculus rift yeah yeah definitely yeah i think that that, that would be easier like let's say uh the for example the cell shaded prince of persia i actually want a game where you jump around and perform acrobatics and the wouldn't it be disorienting like doing acrobatics is there a limitation yeah. for the oculus yeah yeah like there is the, even just in walking around like the game that was there you walked around in a narrow cave and a wolf at the, the first try a wolf came from the front and attacked you the next time you had to turn 180 degrees to get the wolf so mm-hmm. so so even in that like even just like the whole turning aspect uh like was pretty nauseating so yeah i'm not because the problem with, with like platforming and performing any major physical movement be- becomes that your body isn't actually doing any of that stuff your body is just holding a controller while uh, all the stuff happens around you so i'm not but i have heard from people that if they fall from somewhere while playing an oculus rift game they do get a sense of vertigo huh. i'm interested yeah like i don't know what will happen if, if i Sounds play like... if i play mirror's edge in that for example yeah. or a game like thief in, in in the oculus yeah oh man imagine like <clears throat> leaning around a corner just to see where the guards are and what they're saying yeah kill yourself if you play dishonored and try and blink <laughs> the sonnet would be interesting yeah if especially Sonnet. with the blink and stuff for sure uh so any final thoughts on the oculus rift or should we move on i think it's a great platform and we, like i think it's just keep starting out so you have to see the i think there's a lot of innovation to be done on it and even the stuff we're talking about now a couple of years from now we'll say oh we were thinking really small you know people are going to come up with really weird and cool ways to use this i think Yeah. Then again, that's probably what Nintendo st- thought when they released the Wii U. So what do I know? Or the 3DS. Hey, mm-hmm. the 3DS has done well. It did. Are you talking about the 2DS or the 3DS? The 3DS. The 3DS uh, has but... done really, really well. It's it's selling like hotcakes. It's probably no, one but... of the last bastions to disprove the theory that handheld consoles are on their way out. Yeah, but I don't think the 3D effect necessarily was received very well. I think most games have pretty much abandoned the 3D effect. most nintendo games have it but uh, most of the uh, non nintendo games have and it's they're still selling because that that platform just has good games made for it yeah, yeah. right so let's move on to uh, the second bit of news which was a uh, jeff wogel article uh, his 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 website making a second appearance on our podcast uh, about the place of video game critics and why we need critics even if 
99 percent people are not interested in meaningful criticism and they just want let's plays and reviews and a recommendation to buy or not so yeah this is totally not a controversial topic at all so let's start with vivek i think it's an interesting article i read it uh, after you sent the email out today but i disagree with a lot of the points that he's making i think he says in parts of his article that good criticism will lead to a change in the kind of games that we make and would lead to new kinds of games being made i don't think that critics should ever get to decide the kind of games that get made in this industry developers should always make the games they want to they want to make and the games they want to play uh as opposed yeah. to making the games that a select group of like you know elite critics decide you know what mm, we get i like from the article what i got was that like uh, a lot of the times the feedback developers get after making their games isn't very good like most most criticism is on the level of okay sound 8 out of 10 the gameplay felt fun but at times it was frustrating and there wasn't really any meaningful crit- like uh the example he gave was that uh like in films you can have like certain critics analyze the cinematography they analyze this like the pacing of the film and stuff like that whereas many critics are just okay it felt fun it was a great ride it was exhilarating so i think what he was uh, trying to say was that we need like the other kind of critics as well so developers and players could get more detailed feedback as to what Sure, he says that, but then he also goes on to say that those critics, specifically, their job is to influence the kind of games that get made in the industry, which I don't think is, I don't yeah, think that's healthy. Yeah, but don't players and critics already influence what what gets made in this industry? How would players that do, players do? Players do, mm-hmm. and the audience influencing the kind of game that you that you want to make that is that's just a commercial necessity. Big uh, developers have to, to a certain extent, cater to the audience. but catering to an elite group of like he's essentially saying that there should be a like a select group of elite critics somewhere and based on their feedback we should decide what games do and don't get made which is not the best way to go about things Th- their feedback should matter and they should have a voice just as much as everyone else has a voice right it should be part of the like it should be part of the collective output and the collective feedback that any game gets when it comes out a game like Bastion should have criticism written about it, wherein the game systems are analyzed and the game's narrative is analyzed and put under a fine-tooth comb, and then you know Super Dan gets feedback. But then there are also players who are going to play the game and give feedback on a on an amateur level, and there are also you know reviewers who are going to give feedback on a much more commercial kind of sound eight out of ten, like you said. And all that feedback should matter. And at the end of the day, the developer has to make a decision as to what they want to make. You know. I, I have no problem with adding a new set of voices. I have a problem with adding uh, a a new set of voices that will now become like you know the dominant set of voices in our industry because then it will become meet the new boss same as the old boss, you know. Hmm. Okay, so uh, Ashwin, what do you think about the article? For one, I don't see I don't really see a difference between say game criticism and criticism in any other field, be it books or movies or any of the others. but what i feel about criticism is that or uh, reviews is that it's like people are outsourcing the process of thinking to other people like somebody else do the job for me i'll read and make my views out of that instead of exploring the actual medium because everybody can't be bothered to play games with the same intensity or same devotion i guess so it's it's again the tendency of humanity to just band together in groups okay this guy says the stuff which i mostly agree with so i'll go by what his opinion is and so a lot of us band around a particular reviewer and her opinions and this in turn this banding causes a feedback which is sales i think that's what you were driving it hmm. so i don't uh... see if this can be up. no what what i actually took away from the article was that um, a majority of the criticism right now is of a very amateur level and many critics do not understand the medium like many critics now uh, talk in terms of the game is fun level 4 was bad uh, the xp rewards didn't like i couldn't care about the xp rewards they don't uh, they cannot go into any finer detail they cannot 
actually analyze a mechanic and the place it has in the game in the entire game uh, so i was wondering let's shift the discussion to what your ideal game critic would be uh, yeah let's say both of you want to make a, your ideal game critic so vivek what would your ideal critic talk about <laughs> I, I don't know that as a developer, I should say, I should tell a critic what they should or shouldn't do. Just a disclaimer before everything I'm going to say now. But yeah, as a developer, it's not my business to tell critics what their job is. Critics get to decide what they want to do or what they don't want to do. But for me, I think uh, someone who understands the business of making video games, not just on the commercial side, not just on the PR side, but someone who understands how decisions get made inside a video game studio and on what basis features get put in and features get cut. And someone who has a basic technical understanding of how games get made and is able to dissect game design. Hmm, okay, so, so you, yeah. uh, okay, so you are kind of in the whole, like the critics will also understand the business side of development. Uh, Ashwin, what yeah. do you think? Uh, well, uh, I do have a reviewer whose writing I hugely enjoy. So that is Tom Chick. I find that a lot of his writings mm-hmm. resonate with what I think, and we kind of agree on what uh, what games are good. Is Tom Chick the reviewer who gave Deus Ex the lowest, oh. the infamous review? I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So so yeah, I I'm just going to decline to comment on Tom Chick further. <laughs> I'm sure Tom Chick is a relieved, Tom, relieved man now. Tom Chick, Tom. more like Tom Dick. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the best thing I uh, like about his reviews is that he stays away from bullet points that a lot of reviewers do. Like they say, uh, they, one paragraph deals with the length of the game, the next paragraph deals with the gameplay, the next paragraph deals with the audio. You know how many reviews are constructed. But yeah. this guy has fresh approaches on most games. I'm sure you might have read or at least heard about the XCOM review where an XCOM player from the future was talking to an XCOM player in the past. I haven't played either of these games, but I found that review worthwhile on its own, even taken taken away from the context of the game. I found it a rewarding reading. So I think for me, that is probably uh, the, the true test of a, of a good review. Can it stand on its own without context? Okay. Uh, okay. So for me, I would I would prefer more reviewers like uh, Super Bunny Hop and Camster, like who are two people who actually analyze games uh, similar to what Vivek said, and analyze the design choices and the general uh, conceit behind them, like the whole social kind of thing as well. So, so yeah, I like yeah. those two reviewers. Yeah. I, I think Super Bunny Hop definitely closer than Campster. Campster has a good understanding of design, but I don't know that he has an understanding of the business of video games. Yeah, yeah, but at uh, that point, uh, does any critic really know about Marvel's business strategy for their Avengers movies, for example? I'm not sure if uh, asking them to be uh, relate understand the business side of it it's like, uh, no, would probably. Be- I'm not talking about the business side in the sense of the the PR side or the marketing side. I'm talking about the business side in the sense of what. How how the decision making mechanisms in a studio work, mm-hmm. you know? On what basis does say CD Projekt Red decide to uh, make Cyberpunk, you know? But isn't like, that a, a thing where only like C, only CD Projekt Red know truthfully whether or not they like let's say yeah. a critic dis- uh, says okay I think that is what CD Projekt Red said but in actually they did something else so. So it's a, it's a but, very uh, speculative kind of thing, right? You're yeah, almost... but here's the thing. Yeah, go ahead. But here's the thing. Like, if a journalist's job is to have sources in companies mm-hmm. and have people who tell him or her things that they then sit down and interpret and analyze and print, right? Mm, but now you're like going into the difference of a, a critic and a journalist. A journalist is just supposed to report stuff, right? And a yeah, critic but is supposed it, to review pieces of art and stuff like that. Sure. Sure, but to, to be able to review pieces of art or to be able to review video games, you need to have an understanding of how those games are made. And to do that, or, and to have that understanding, I think you need to have sources in the places where games are made, which is game studios. Mm-hmm. 
right? Okay, so... I, I also think uh, here, like for, again, full disclosure, video game companies make a big mistake by not being transparent with video game journalists and critics by not giving them access to all of their employees. And that's why a lot of people are scared from speaking out understandably, because if someone from CDPR says, all right, we cut this feature in Witcher 2, or we put like in Witcher, in Witcher 1 and Witcher 2, a feature that some people find pretty controversial is uh, the, the, you won't find people coming out and speaking about it because people aren't comfortable talking about why decisions like that are made, right? Oh, in, in, in a, in, let's take a non-controversial thing because that's something controversial. The combat design in The Witcher 2, right? You won't find a lot of people who, are, who will be willing to come out and say, this is the basis of how we designed our combat. You know, not, not, I'm not talking about high-level employees in developer diaries. You have that all the time. I'm talking about the people who actually do, the, who make the animation trees, the mid to junior level developers who sit down and design a system will rarely ever come out and say, this is the basis, like, you know, these are the emails in which we sat down and like nailed, nailed out our combat system. And this is how it came to fruition, right? And that won't happen because studios are not comfortable letting out their creative process and publishers are not comfortable with journalists having and critics having that, that level of access to studios. Hmm. Neither, are, so... neither are all journalists or critics interested in having that level of access to low level employees of, you know, big studios. People want to talk to the heads of studios because that's, you know, they're more glamorous. Hmm. So, uh, so what you're saying is, uh, like what, what I get from this is that, uh, in your opinion, uh, the ideal critic would probably be a former developer, preferably of the same studio. So they would know the, exactly what the decision making process of the studio was and review a game on that light. I don't think so man i think i think if you're a good critic or a, like if you're if you're someone who's been even a journalist even as someone who's outside the fraternity i think if you've been in this business long enough if you've been here for 10 years you've made friends you have contacts everywhere you should have contacts everywhere if you're doing your job properly hmm, funnily so, enough like the general consensus right now is that uh game critics are too close to the industry there are a lot of friends and like there are lots of insider circles and stuff like that you have to make friends you have to like you have to not you have to know people otherwise how are you going to do your job if you don't know people how are they going to talk to you how are they going to open up to you that's how reporters in every other field are no, able but, to tell uh, but i think right? you're actually mixing uh, reporting which is like interviewing people and stuff with criticism which is just i like somebody playing the game and analyzing but effect, what the game Yeah, is. but to effectively criticize something, you need to understand how it works and mm -hmm. how it was built. Don't you think so? So No, like, but like... There is why there's criticism on an emotional level. There is criticism on a personal level that a lot of people do. There are a lot of people who will talk about a game and how it affected them on a personal level. And for that, that is separate. Uh, that no, is separate. But why does the person need uh, like friends in the studio and contacts in the industry? They can just play the game and take it at, at face value. That's what? fine. You asked, you asked what, like, again, you asked what my personal, like, game critic would be, oh. right? This is what I think would be a good game critic. Yeah. Right? This is not a qualifier. And okay. even before I said all this, I have no right to tell game critics what they should or shouldn't do. Yeah. I'm very clear about that. This is what I think would be a good game critic. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, now that we have established that Vivek is wrong, let's move ahead to the <laughs> next topic, uh, uh, which is uh, Black Mesa. Uh, the infamous or famous actually both mod is getting a full fully featured commercial release so what on do you steam? think about that yeah on steam obviously uh, apart from like yay what do you think let's start with ashwin this time first well uh, i would like to ask you why did he call it infamous uh, because of its long development time it has been in development for basically forever uh, i think what does that make you you can forever Oh, no, no, no. I think it was just competing with Half-Life 3, but lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Joe uh, uh Yeah, having, I haven't played through Black Mesa. I just started off a little, uh, sampled some levels. Uh, I think, for one, I would like to salute the whole team. They didn't know they would get a Steam release probably when they started off on this. And just as a passion project, they did it for years, two, three years. And that's amazing commitment. And it's, it's good to see that it has come to a point where they can actually make careers out of this. And Valve, having the reputation for being the good folks in the industry, 
and probably they have gotten a good deal out of this. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting to know that Black Mesa might be on Steam and they'll be rewarded for what they did. And probably it might be the first game to come out with the new source engine, the remote source engine. Who knows? Hmm. Interesting. Now, Vivek, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I think Valve's done something really smart in terms of making them look, re- making themselves look really good. Yeah, this is a good move. And I'm excited. Like, uh, I think the Black Mesa guys have done a great job. And it's not that you won't be able to play the game for free anymore either, which is the, which is amazing. You can yeah. still play the game for free even after it comes out. You know, it's just an option yeah. to buy it for money to support the developers. Awesome. Uh, uh, so Vivek, as a person who is an insider into uh, bloated and incompetent game studios, uh, why don't other studios give uh, have this kind? Of, why don't other studios let models like if a model comes up comes with a great concept or a great mod to them, why don't they uh, give they license their IP? Why do you think like let's say let's say why why wouldn't United Front Games, for example, do this? If I may just interrupt, uh, models who have done work on Dystopia, for example. <laughs> yeah yeah but <laughs> yeah we actually got a full fully featured release on uh, steam i think yeah at, like the the time which dystopia was in the uh, the scene there wasn't really the whole concept of like jonathan blue hadn't invented indie games yet oh uh, we just released free i think i think you're you're making a mistake there the behemoth hadn't invented indie games yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's bc before chris hacker <laughs> Indeed. Uh, no, I think uh, I I don't know. I think United Front is a bad example in that case because they made Mod Nation Racers, which is essentially one of the most mod friendly games you'll find. Uh, it's one of those games in Sony's Play Share Create campaign. Uh, why don't companies, why don't larger companies put out uh, their games and make them moddable? Because most dev studios don't own the IP that they're making. They're owned by publishers, and publishers are protective of their IP because they want their IP to have as much longevity as possible in the public eye. They want to keep making sequels. They want people to think that this is something that they can pay for, that they have to pay money for, and not get for free, because they think that once people get something for free, they're never going to pay money for it again. Uh, I don't know that that is the the right way to think about video games necessarily, but that's the way some people approach it, for sure. Hmm. Uh, uh, a similar case is actually what I uh, sort of related is like the Amnesia Machine for Pigs thing, where they uh, they also got a mod team to make a new Amnesia game. The, the, the Chinese room had already been successful with uh, yeah. Air Esther's commercial release doing quite well. I think they, uh, the, indie, the indie fund guys recouped their budget within yeah. a a day of Dare Esther's release. Yeah, that if I'm amazing. not correct, uh, if I'm if I'm like, pardon me if I'm wrong, but I think another level designer first took like did the majority of the work on Dare Esther rather than the Chinese room. Uh, oh, really? The mirrors, yeah, he was the level one of the level designers on Mirrors Edge, and like oh. I remember the the original screenshots on Mod TV, uh, and he's he actually did. Almost all of the level design work in Dear Esther, like converting that to the new uh, engine and stuff. So yeah, it's so, it's also a little bit Dear Esther commercial release in itself is also a case of the Dear Esther thing being licensed to somebody else. So yeah, it's it's a good rabbit hole. Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the Amnesia Machine for Pigs case is, is I I think it's a very smart move by uh, the fictional games guys because. Uh, amnesia can now become this. Uh, it be, it takes on a kind of like a, uh, you know, a chameleon kind of thing yeah. because every yeah. studio that it, that it goes to will change the way it, it looks like slightly a little bit, and it will have its own unique voice. If they keep playing past the parcel like this, so say Chinese Room passes on the next Amnesia to another studio, uh, you know, I think that that studio will have a, a new and different and cool take on it. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, this, this is definitely a healthy trend. I think I think it's a lot easier for studios like Frictional Games and Valve to do this because Valve owns Half Life and Frictional Games owns Amnesia. They own those IPs. So yeah. it's, it's a it's a it's very easy to make those decisions when the organization isn't large. You know, it's it's not yeah. rooted. So they're not fifty people that you have to talk to and all of them have to sign off before you have to do before you can do this. Yeah, I'm sure. 
if one person was in charge at EA who could, who could just make the final decision and say, all right, we're giving Syndicate to X guys, they can make the remake now. And they can make a turn-based strategy game that everyone huh. would love to play. Yeah. That would that would happen instantly. Yeah. Because there is definitely someone in EA who, de- who wants to make that happen. It's just the mm-hmm. machinery, to get the machinery moving to make it happen is too much of an effort to put in. Yeah. And the Syndicate FPS did not do very well. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if somebody in at uh, Square Enix would would give modders a chance to make a good thief game for once. Yeah, I would like to see that happen. <laughs> like, like you mean the dark project? Yeah, the dark mod. Yeah, the dark mod. Oh, the the dark, dark project was the the, the subtitle of the first original thief game. game. Yeah, the first thief game. Yeah. If <laughs> so, if so, if they if they went to the dark mod guys and said, you know, you guys can put out your game on Steam and we're gonna, you know. We're gonna give a free copy of Thief One and Thief Two with the, everyone who buys the Dark Mod. So we make money, you make money, everybody wins. Yeah, that would not. That would be, I think, a, a good deal, right? A lot of people would say, "All right, that's that's good value for money there." Yeah, that sounds but, too, too sensible a decision for Square Enix to make somehow. I don't know. They've made some good decisions, man. They've made some good bets in the past. Uh, yeah. And I, I still want uh, the, the new Thief game to be a good game. As much as we've ragged on it in the past few weeks, <laughs> I yeah. still want it to be a good game. And I have faith in the, uh, in Idos Montreal. They're, they're a studio that's known for making good games. So let's wait and see. Yeah. You know? mm, okay. So uh, Ashwin, any final thoughts on uh, whatever the hell we were discussing right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so should I move on? Uh, to what are the hell we were discussing? To what are the yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we're going to be discussing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's yeah, so let's move on to uh, our main discussion topic for uh, today, which is. Uh, which is, uh, let's say you were to make a, a game that's a satire of something. Uh, wh- how would you go ahead in uh, in actually designing that game? And like, uh, what what would the game be a satire of? And this whole discussion is, uh, it was originally formulated because there was, there's this game called Jossel Bastard who was made in response to the developer feeling that Hotline Miami didn't really satirize violence in a way that uh, Hotline Miami got a lot of critical acclaim for supposedly being self-aware of like personally it's a great game to play but I didn't see that self-awareness either so that this topic felt kind of relevant to me but yeah uh, okay so let's go ahead with uh, yeah Ashwin uh, let's say you want to make a game that satirizes something so what would you like to satirize and how would you start making this game actually I think somebody has already made that game so this is slightly, I don't know, um, this game I'm going to talk about is a highly acclaimed game, which felt like a parody in many places. I think it has a, got a meta score of 94 or above on uh, Metacritic, I'm not sure. I'm jo- talking about Uncharted 2. The many parts of Uncharted 2 actually felt like a parody for me. And uh, I think if I... If I were to make a parody of a game, it would be on those lines. Let me just explain this a little because it might sound a little weird. So Yes, it does. It sounds very yeah, weird. I, I didn't know that Naughty Dog was suddenly wanting to satirize the entire video game. But yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So wh- wh- one aspect is, so there is this level in Uncharted 2 where you are in a collapsing building. There is this huge helicopter outside. I think Naughty Dog has a fetish for helicopters and destroying them. So this helicopter outside is raining bullets on the building. Uh, and actually, Drake is inside, flanked by an army of mercenaries. And the building is going down, mind you. The helicopter is taking down the building, setting up a fantastic set piece where you have to jump across the rubble, shoot the mercenaries, and you know, blah, blah, blah. But my question was this. All, all the while, while playing this game, my question was simple. When the building was collapsing, why would the mercenaries still stay there and shoot at Drake? They're mercenaries, they're being paid to do their job. Wouldn't they just run away from there? So, I actually found myself laughing out, not laughing out loud, but smiling to myself. Uh, I think this is the kind of element that I would put in a 
in a, in a parody game, if I would were to make it, where uh, the, the people who are actually being paid to kill, not running away and saving their lives, but pressing on with fanatic devotion and just, just trying to get the player who's the center of the universe uh, to get him killed. Yeah. I think the, the conceit of a lot of games that you're out there to save the world and the entire universe revolves around you. You are a singular superhero who can who can kill hordes of people. And you know how you've seen this in a lot of games where you kill a thousand people and then at the end there's a cutscene where a boss holds a, a tiny gun to your head and you have to give up your precious artifact. So I think the the satire is already there in a lot of games. Thank you. <laughs> hmm, um, I actually did not understand what I think what Ashwin the is talking was. about. You know, in the sense that uh, Arvind, people sometimes are laughing at the game, not with the game. I think Ashwin is saying that he was satirizing at all those games, not with oh, them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, that was pretty high concept even for me. Like, I'm a pretty vicious douchebag. So, yeah, let's move I on think... to Vivek and what Vivek, like, yeah, Vivek just what would game be? I, I'll get to my game with okay. just one addendum before, uh, before I start. Yeah. Ashwin, you know, in your game in which people are, uh, you know, killing the hero, uh, trying to kill the hero while the world around them is going to shit, you need to have a union rep standing on the side saying, guys, we're not getting paid enough to do this. <laughs> Just to acknowledge what's going on. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I mean, yeah. <laughs> but I doubt anybody will ever make a triple A parody game. Uh. I think No One Lives Forever is as close as it gets to something like that. Oh, that's one mm. game I yeah. But I would love to have that. Like, really high production values, but laugh out loud funny. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I I don't know. Like, uh, what satire in games, the, the thing is, there have been a lot of satirical games. Uh, I think, to some extent... Uh, Stanley Parable is a, is a pretty big satire of, of the way narrative works in video games and the way choice works in video games, and they do a really good job. Uh, Portal is a satire to some extent, uh, as well as Bioshock also. A lot of people, like including myself, think that Bioshock is a satire on you know players always following instructions in video games without having to think. Uh, I think the problem with the way we deal with satire in video games is that it rarely involves interactivity. So I'd go along the lines of, trying to make a game in which the satire is in the play, not in the narrative. I'd make a game in which the narrative is extremely serious, but everything that you're doing is kind of subverting normal play mechanics. Okay. And I, yeah. Hmm. So would it be That's what I'd like. Something on the lines of, like there is really interesting gameplay moment that's going to happen and suddenly you cut to a cutscene. Is that what you had in mind? Yes, something like that. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, so basically, Metal Gear Solid meets Beyond Two Souls. Ah, uh, yes. Wow. So you just took like two of the games like infamous for their long cutscenes with no interactivity. So like, why not just make a movie or something? <laughs> hey, Metal Gear Solid is not just famous for uh, lack of like not not just famous for its cutscenes. It's also famous for yeah. I was actually thinking some, some... Metal Gear Solid Four. Because that that had this infamous problem. I was thinking two and three. Oh uh, right, yeah. Those are my favorite Metal Gear. Yeah, games. two is actually yeah. You should probably uh, look at the Super Bunny of analysis of Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, 2. yeah. I did, I did, I did. Yeah. Link me to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think definitely, definitely stuff like you know, uh, mechanics that involve like there are a lot of mechanics you'll find in these uh, first person games these days about eating and and drinking and smoking and like you know, I like to I'd like to make a game in which if after a certain point you drink too much, you become an alcoholic, and if you smoke too much, you're addicted to smoke smokes, and so to, to retain focus, you need to smoke cigarettes. Remind? And then I eventually, think Fallout already did, did this, right? Follow. Not not the new ones. The old ones did it. Yes, no, no, I'm think. certain. Like in New Vegas, you can get addicted to alcohol and smoke cigarettes and stuff. Yeah, because yeah. I remember getting addicted to alcohol in. It's an Obsidian game. It doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Obsidian games are too good for this mortal world. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. Anything with Chris Avalon's name on it is above criticism. It's pretty much above <laughs> criticism. 
okay so okay uh, i was actually Starbucks. thinking of a game where uh, which was meant to be an a uh, game like democracy 3 which came out recently and democracy 2 and about the elections and what uh-huh. what i had thought was uh, to to have a game that starts off very simple that's like okay just promise certain things like the first election you of your party promise certain things and campaigns at certain places and then depending on your performance you win but slowly i would like to uh, subvert those mechanics like start using underhanded tactics and so for every pro- pro- uh, pro- uh, progressing election the next election you get slightly more the mechanics slightly change and the election becomes more dirtier so if you want to keep winning you'll have to get progressively dirtier and dirtier and that's kind of the like this, this was inspired partly by xcom and where like there's new threats and you adapt to those threats i was thinking that's a awesome. game like that would uh, really yeah would probably fit the kind of uh, satirical game that would also be very fun to play that sounds really depressing arvin you start out all idealistic and then real life wears you down and in the end you're this corrupt monster who's just murdering people so that you can become you know get into power yeah yeah it's also called indie games that's getting edited out <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you yeah i don't know you either arvin <laughs> yeah okay yeah so <laughs> Okay, so like in case it's really getting edited out, I can just like say that again without you know. That's a never. Never me. It's a never slap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, that was kind of more. Uh, I was more focused on the mechanics side of a uh, of what a true satirical game would be. So usually the satire aims to satire aims to demonstrate and then like also show something better. Of of the thing that that it's satirizing. So, so I'm actually yeah like, so yeah, a game like this would probably be <laughs> a good thing to demonstrate the whole kind of how politics gets to where it has right now. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Also, I don't know. I think it'd be cool if you if we we could make like a a, a modern military game in which ninety percent of the game is just sitting around and waiting, and mm-hmm. there's little to no like there's. you almost never fight yeah and even when you do fight it's it looks more like missile command than the actual <laughs> yeah it looks modern yeah, warfare looks, stuff then then it looks like modern warfare like 90% of the time you're in a camp and people are going crazy because it's hot and you don't you know you can't move around freely and yeah. stuff like that yeah it's just it's just dealing with human beings which is 90% of anyone's job is dealing yeah. with human beings Yeah. and that's the military as well mm-hmm. it's just that those situations are more tense because yeah you have a gun in your hand and you're probably standing in a border in the middle of this really hot sun you know it's yeah <laughs> yeah I, i think it'd be interesting to do a game which is essentially like like excom base manager but you're managing like this modern military camp and you don't you don't get to like even unlike excom you don't just to get get to shoot anything whenever you want to because modern military In modern warfare there are rules of engagement you can't just engage anybody that you see you need to get an okay from people before you can fire your gun even it's not allowed to just start firing when you get into a place yeah i think it'd be interesting to explore that aspect of warfare wherein it's boring and it's kind of funny and it's kind of depressing uh, mm-hmm. satirize the way we look at war in in big triple a game i suppose yeah not like spec ops does but you know in a in a genuinely funny way Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, uh, do you think uh, like with the general trends and all, uh, will any independent developer or like l- let's just forget big developers, but is there will any independent developer try to make a game like this? I think so. I, I'm I'm actually surprised that you know the battlefield games aren't like this already because considering battlefield's multiplayer, which is about large maps, you know the perfect game you'd think for a battlefield campaign would be you're you're in a base and it's slow. it's not uh-huh. this fast paced thing it's this slow yeah. campaign where in 90% of the time is build up it's like a tarantino movie or a scene in a tarantino movie where 70 to 80% of the dialogue in the scenes is just build up it's like a pressure cooker you're waiting you're waiting you're waiting for something really bad to happen and mm-hmm. and and that's how you get tension out right? you like i'm i was talking about it in terms of a satire but even as a player right even doing mundane things 
it it will add to the tension if you if you make those mundane things just a, just add a little bit of tension to them because if you if you make something like all right the camps out of water we have to go get water if you make a trek into a into a village where people don't like you if you make it a little bit scary maybe no guns go off but people are staring at you all the time that's already a more interesting experience than most of the other first person shooters in modern military settings that you played right right it's already tense but i'm i'm surprised the battlefield guys haven't done this i think it's just the urge to compete with call of duty has yeah, made them yeah i'm actually not surprised at all like the usual market for these games is like even like even if we assume that these are very sophisticated players and stuff i don't know if like uh, the usual modern military player will like will want to just have games where that's hours and hours but of setting and you really think right water. yeah but people who buy battlefield buy it for the multiplayer hmm. they don't buy it for the single player everyone who buys it is very very uh, like yeah. is on the record saying we don't care about the single player it can go to hell we care about multiplayer multiplayer is what's fun so if you can get make a good single player if you can experiment to the point where you get a good single player that brings in a new audience what's the harm in taking that risk <laughs> yeah. why are you going after call of duty's audience you're not going to be able to beat call of duty in the kind of single player campaigns they make they've been doing it for too long they have too much experience on their side in making that kind of campaign and yeah, from the enough, first yeah, like, doesn't sound like anything any uh, big studio but yeah like uh, i want to be optimistic but uh so I think, Ashwin, I think, yeah no go ahead the funny thing is a couple of generations or uh, game generations back we were doing this right that that's how duke nukem duke nukem and serious sam came out and there were yeah. probably big studios doing it yeah they they became the biggest studios of their time the serious mm-hmm. sam and the 3d realm guys like you know mm-hmm. but I'm that was when sure if like uh, it's probably more of a uh, sort of parody of pop culture rather than other video games but yeah i can see where you're coming from but in the 90s video games were based off of action movies right they're based off of these big action sci-fi type type, type movies so this the parody of that became duke nukem mm. the parody of that action hero type figure became duke nukem and so now the parody or like the antithesis of this modern military shooter we haven't gotten to that yet we haven't gotten to anyone who's willing to take that kind of risk mm, yeah okay so uh, should we wrap this up or do we have anything else you want to discuss i think is there anything else other interesting thing i remember is uh, baldur's gate the enhanced edition coming out any thoughts oh, yeah. baldur's gate 2 yeah yeah i can't yeah that that's a good thing and such a bad thing for my wallet <laughs> yeah it's a good thing because it's baldur's gate 2 and the bad thing is that it's one of the best role playing games ever made and like we are, we are like what was it like 10 years or so ago <laughs> hey i think you're forgetting mass effect 2 Oh, you went there. <laughs> yeah, did. yeah. No, I think there have been. I think there have been good role-playing games since. I, I, I think Baldur's Gate is. I just think still yeah. a lot of them compare to Baldur's Gate too. Ah, uh, what compare? Like role-playing games in the last last generation of video games. This that's also a good conversation to have now. Like yeah, games that we remember this... from this last generation mm-hmm. of video games. Yeah, perhaps the next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Arvind is so against talking about anything last generation or console for that matter. Mm-hmm. But anyway, in a, in, a, in a, uh, on the note you were talking about, good RPGs from the last five years. Do any of you guys like have any standout RPGs from the last five years? The Witcher, Probably Fallout New Vegas, The Witcher, and Fallout New Vegas for sure. Uh, Fable Two, The Witcher actually is an interesting game because the. Uh, it's a it's a good rpg but at the same time it's it's not like what i would consider uh, an ideal rpg mm, yeah it's it's a, it's a tricky thing the witcher i say the witcher is definitely in the last 5 years one of my stand out rpg experiences has definitely been the witcher 1 and 2 both those games have been excellent in terms of not just choice but even in terms of building an interesting new kind of world to to role play in yeah dragon age origins mm, yeah dragon age origins yeah And what else? What else? Last five years, I think. Yeah. Shadowrun returns. Yeah, Shadowrun returns is good too. Yeah. But that's definitely that, that's just pretty much a retro game getting a nice, you know, new skin. Yeah, it's it's actually surprisingly, uh, almost depressingly linear. So yeah, but it's yeah. very well presented. That I'll give them that. Yeah. It's well presented and it's well written. Uh, guys, how about Alpha Protocol? That was a standout game for me. 
yes absolutely yeah, alpha protocol yeah the absolutely, problem yes. <laughs> alpha protocol is such a weird beast to analyze like it's 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 disappointing but yet it's it's like in in places you have lots of potential i just wish they had got more time you know because i think with some polish alpha protocol would have been one of the like stand up games RPGs. yeah one yeah. of the best rpgs ever ever made it's already one of my stand out rpg experiences ever but it's it's stopped short of getting into like you know an all time hall of fame kind or great yeah. kind of list uh, because it's buggy essentially because it's a buggy experience yeah. i think it's the same category i would put it exactly in the same category as say vampire the masquerade uh, yeah 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 uh, So I don't know if you guys will count this as an RPG, but I do at least. So I, uh, Yakuza Three. I was gonna say that. Yeah. I haven't Yakuza. played any Yakuza game. But it's uh, it's more of an open world game than an RPG. That's how I don't know. It is, but it it feels like an R. It feels like an RPG. Just the kind of things that you do in that game and the breadth of things that you can do on that game in that game. It feels like an RPG. It feels like you're inhabiting that world. But uh, in the same sense, do people call GTA RPGs? Or do they call it something else? No, GTA is open world action game. Yeah, this Yakuza like does you can you actually change the storyline and stuff in like in Yakuza? Uh, I don't think so. No, you can't. You can't change the storyline. The closest Yakuza. analogy I could think of was GTA or Mafia. Mm-hmm. I think. Uh, yeah. I don't think. I don't think it's uh, exactly the, as linear as those games. It has a linear main plot, but the the kind of side quests that you go into get. pretty pretty interesting uh, like uh, there are options in some of the side quests in, in those games yeah it doesn't have branching narrative paths for sure but i think in terms of inhabiting a world and feeling like you are that character it does a much better job of consistency in terms of tone than a gta or a mafia game actually that's the thing i think if you are taking role playing in uh, the words literal sense actually role playing then i think yakuza yeah. is a good fit you role play a lot That's yes, like you feel like a retired gangster who's raising children in an orphanage. The kind of thing that game makes you do, it it makes you inhabit that role of Kazuma. I think that's the kind of discussion that that goes into the territory of what exactly is a role playing game. Because like yeah. in general, my usual uh, thing is like if I can modify the plot of the game, that's usually a role playing game. So surprisingly, in that with that definition, like. Maybe a bit of Walking Dead and like David Cage stuff. Yeah, that that might also be a role playing game. So yeah, role playing is game is such a nebulous thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a personal definition. I think it it depends yeah. a lot on who's playing it. For me, it depends on the world. And it, if I feel like I'm in that world, then it's a role playing game for me. It it the definition varies from person to person for sure. Yeah. I think we could get an entire podcast to that. Really yeah. I, but what I think we all can agree on is that Arvind's definition is wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it long, are is the longest journey role playing games? Oh, I'm not sure. Like, are they like considered adventure games? Those are adventure games, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're good games, though. They're really good games. Uh. Okay. So yeah. On that note, let's uh just end this podcast before we go into any further ten- tangents. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone, and we hope to see you next week. Yeah. Bye, guys. See you next week. See ya.